Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Creating an Incredible Product Brand. My name is Christine Ange, and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing at eZeus. We are an Andover, Massachusetts-based software company in the unified communications and collaboration space. And um, we've been around for about two and a half years. We're venture-backed. And I'm going to be talking about how do you build an incredible product brand. And I'm going to be using um, what I did at eZeus as kind of a case study towards the end. But this is not a, strictly speaking, case study talk. This is going to be about how do you build a brand for your product that is lasting, that's valuable, that can survive different iterations of a product and that will create a long-term identity for your product that will make it a strong competitor in the marketplace, regardless of the size of your company. How many people are at companies that are less than five years old or have fewer than 50 people? How many people find it challenging to compete in a marketplace where there are bigger players when you might be one of the smaller players there? Yeah, exactly. So part of what I'm going to talk about is how as a smaller player, your brand is a really important influencer of your, your market strength because your brand can often be what distinguishes you from larger competitors and makes you more competitive in a marketplace by having a distinct and unique brand. So what makes for an incredible brand? In a world of same, how do you stand out? Uh, another show of hands, how many people are in B2B? pretty much all over the room. How many people find that B2B brands are often very, very monotonous, bland, and, and flavorless? Yes. Well, we're here to change all of that. First of all, what makes for an incredible product brand is that you have to have a holistic view of branding. Um, you have to realize it's not about pretty. Um, certainly brand books, brand guidelines, having a nice logo, having a set of colors and fonts that you adhere to is what people often think about as, as branding, but that's just the pretty. Um, what really, really defines your brand is that you know who you are and you express it boldly. And in the B2B space, very few people do that. I think in the B2B space, we're very risk averse in many cases. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to appear unbusinesslike, and so we go for very, very bland. Um, we go for, for product brands that are the equivalent of beige carpeting, and, and that needs to stop. Um, one really important part of having a great brand is having honesty and integrity and to work with quality. And obviously, I'm not just talking about your product. I'm talking about how your marketing has to be of a high level of, of quality. And I found that once you take an honest look at your brand, especially if you're a smaller company, and put it out there with integrity, it is by definition going to be unique and distinct from large corporate brands. And it's going to be that much easier to say something meaningful and do it in a unique way if you really honestly say, this is who we are, this is what we are, and this is what we stand for as a product. So coming down from the kumbaya, these are our values and this is what we stand for as a product. Here's some more practical information. Um, there, the formula for a good brand, it's a formula, but it's not formulaic. It's unique to every product. One is resonance. It resonates with what your customers need. Customers have to see your product and say, yes, that is exactly what I have been looking for. You can have the best product on earth, but if it doesn't fulfill what your customers exactly need and it doesn't resonate with them, they're not going to buy it. They're going to go with a larger, safer brand. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. So if you can't resonate better than IBM or whatever large competitor you have with your potential customers, they're not going to buy from you. The other really important thing and the one that I think is one of the most challenging things for people to do with product management is that it has to be other-centered. Um, hands up how many people have seen a, a data sheet or a website or any other product information that just talks about we. We spent a lot of time building this product. We really think our product is great. We are targeted at this marketplace. Customers see that and they just don't believe the product's for them. The product feels like it's a vanity project. It's like, we are great. Other-centeredness when you position a product and you brand a product is you. You need this product because you have this pain point. You need to analyze huge amounts of data. You need to simplify your communications architecture. And this is why 
you need our product. Um, uniqueness, again, going back to what I said before, it's not a generic corporate brand because nothing looks more insincere, especially from a small company. People know you're a small company. If you have a picture of a skyscraper on your homepage and you're out of a basement or a co-working space, it just really looks bad. Even if you are based out of a skyscraper, it still looks bad because everybody's got a picture of a skyscraper somewhere on their website, and it's just horrible. Um, and focus. And your product has to stand for something distinct, which can be articulated succinctly. And try saying that seven times real fast. Um, you don't need 600 words to describe your product. You need two sentences. And if you can't describe a product in two sentences, either it's a very complex product, but even then you can simplify it down, or it's overladen with features, or you haven't figured out what your product is for, what it does, and who it does it for. And that's possibly the worst. So if you're going to define a product brand, the first and foremost thing you need to do is define it very, very succinctly, because people don't have time to pay any attention beyond a few seconds. So brands are not fluff. They're the reason people buy from you. Um, branding, like again, like I said again, it's not, it's not about pretty fonts. It's not about vague, nebulous qualities. It's not about puffing a product up. It's about sincerely saying, this is what my product is for. This is what our product does. This is what it will accomplish for our end users. It is the reason why people buy. And these are the key pillars to a credible brand. One is integrity which means you honor what you say. You don't oversell the features. You don't, essentially, you try to avoid selling what you are aware. You try to avoid saying the product does more than it does. People will find out, probably at the demo stage, what your product actually does. So they should actually find out what your product does at the marketing stage. Because if there is a disconnect between what you see in marketing, and marketers are very enthusiastic people. We are always going to say every product is the best. It's fantastic. It accomplishes everything you've ever wanted, and it slices and dices. But especially in a B2B technology space, you need to avoid that. You need to tone it down. You need to be more factual. And you have to actually say what the product does and just what the product does. And avoid any kind of adjectives that are just padding and just how great it is, because that can make people feel like you've kind of oversold the product. And you may not have meant it that way, but all you are really doing is just being really enthused about the product, but you, it can come across as overselling. Um, quality is very important. Um, not just obviously in your product, but how you present yourself. Obviously we all know, um, hands up who here has a $10 million marketing budget? Not one. One person sort of sheepishly. <laughs> you have to leave now, no, I'm kidding. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the quality of the way in which you present your brand can't be there. In everything from the visuals to the content, there's really no excuse for cheap, not on any budget. It's very important to present a quality brand image out there. It's also about content, especially when you're selling um, any kind of technology product. You explain why and how your product works and you explain it in the right amount of detail. Yeah, you have to articulate your product's brand value very succinctly, but when you get into more detailed aspects of marketing your product, like white papers, like data sheets, more detail is better, more content is better, because you really want to articulate what your product is doing in a way that's very specific, very clear, and very much outlines what customers can expect from your product. Another key aspect of a good brand, and, and one that I don't think I've ever seen talked about in quite this way, is respect. Um, you need to respect your customer, which is different from wanting them to buy from you. Of course you want them to buy from you, but if you don't take their needs seriously, if you don't take their intelligence seriously, that's going to really communicate itself in how you position your brand. 90% of the hyperbole that comes through in marketing, 90% of the, the marketing that comes across as kind of icky, stems from a lack of respect for the customer. Not thinking the customers are going to take the time to understand your product, not thinking that they can understand your product, thinking, thinking your customers maybe just, just don't get the product. That lack of respect will communicate itself in everything about from how you 
basically select the colors for your for your logo. You can I, I think there have been several blow ups in the technology space where for instance products marketed towards women technology products have been made pink. <laughs> and you are going to at the end of the day offend your technology buyer who is a woman if you decide that the main thing she cares about is that her laptop be pink. I actually happen to have a phone with a pink case. So I'm not saying you cannot have pink products, but I didn't buy this phone because I could put pink cases on it, but because it had the amount of memory I wanted. So a lack of taking your customer seriously, whether it's a consumer or whether it's a B2B buy, really, really poisons a brand. And, and what we have found at Isus in branding ourselves is that taking our customers seriously and having a collaborative relationship with our customers, and we're in a little different position because we are founded um, out of a start, out of a non, non-profit open source community. So there was a collaborative two-way discussion based on the open source community before there was a commercial product. But even if you're starting from a commercial product, having a collaborative two-way discussion with your customers, regardless of the size of your company and the size of your customers, really helps feed that respect. And then the third thing is, the, the last thing is depth. Not necessarily a product line because, you know, we all get it. You might be a, a three product company, but of everything else that you put out there about the product, your content, your documentation, and your industry knowledge has to be really deep. And you have to have that come across in your presentations about your product. You, you have to know and understand your industry very well because, again, it goes back to respecting and taking your customers serious. So let's look at each of these in detail. Um, Residents, um, obviously, every, how many people have been told to put yourself in your customer's shoes? Yeah. You hear it so many times that it no longer has any meaning. Um, really, to put yourself in your customer's shoes, you can't. You are not your customer. Even if you, um, at the end of the day, are part of your target market, for instance, you're selling to IT professionals and you yourself are an IT professional, you still can't put yourself in your customer's shoes because you're not the customer. Um, you have to listen. You have to get frontline feedback, and frontline feedback is way worth more than focus groups. Um, actually listening to actual customers, talking about the product, and we we do a lot of that at EZUS. We're in the business of um, building up our customer advisory council pretty soon, so that we actually will meet with customers on a regular basis and get their feedback from people who are implementing our communication solutions right now and ask them what's working and what's not. You have to do that. Yes, it's time consuming. Yes, um, maybe hiring an outside research organization might be an easier way to go about finding out what your customers think, but listening face to face to your own customers is going to, at the end of the day, make for a much better product. And it's gonna make your product resonate better with your customers because they actually gave feedback on the product before you built the next iteration of it. So that's very important. And the other thing is to listen to the industry itself. Listen to people who are not your customers and try to find out why they're not your customers. That can be very important. And whether you do that through a, a third party research organization or whether you do that um, by talking to people who at the end after doing a demo chose not to buy, it's very, very important to find out from people why you did not resonate with them. And it might turn out that they're just not in your target audience, um, but you need to know that as well. And if you can, listen to industry experts. I mean, you know, it, it depends on what your budget is, but listen to people who are completely objective third parties, whether you can afford a relationship with analysts or whether you just sort of bounce ideas off of your advisory board, but listen to people who are a step or two away from your product and find out how to make your product resonate more. Other-centeredness. Um, this is a very, very difficult thing to do when you're managing a product because you are so absorbed in your product. We built this. This product is really cool because it took us a lot of hours to build it. It's a message you see over and over again in marketing messages um, written by amateurs, if I can say that. <laughs> You have to use, you have to be aware of your language. This is actually, other, other centeredness is the easiest problem to fix. If you get up and talk about your product 
like a kindergartner talking about how they spent their summer vacation. I had a good time. I went to the beach. I took my dog for a walk. I got new shoes. Um, that, that kind of kindergartner way of talking about things, which you do when you're kind of heads down in a product, it's the easiest thing to fix on earth because you just need to change your language. You have to talk about how you solve their problems. You have this problem. We are going to fix it for you. Um, you need a product that does this. And one shorthand that people are taught that I think is actually wrong is how many people have been told to talk about benefits, not features, and that that's good. Yeah. Um, you can actually talk about features till the cows come home. Really, you really can. As long as you talk about the features in relation to what your customers need. The reason people are told to talk about benefits and not the features is because often when people talk about features, they talk about how long it took them to design the feature. And oh my God, I slaved over a hot stove all day. I'm so tired. Creating all these features is the conversation your marketing often has. But if you talk about you have been aching for these features, then the features discussion goes from being a self-centered conversation to being an other-centered conversation. And in fact, thinking about benefits can guide the features discussion into a good place. So if you think about, well, why does somebody need these features, then you can talk about the features because you know why your customer would want them. So throw out everything you've ever heard about features versus benefits, and instead it's us versus them. And you talk about them, the customer. Uniqueness. Do not worry about being different. And when, you, when I get to the case study, you will realize how very different we have chosen to be and how it's benefited us. Um, if you are a small company in a crowded market, um, the last thing you want is to have your website look like a cheap knockoff of your big multi-billion dollar competitors because it's just going to look like a cheap knockoff. It's going to be dull. It's not going to differentiate you. You're going to look like sort of you're late to the party or you're trying to imitate something you're not and you're far better off being distinctive. It's not a handicap. It may make you nervous, um, but it is not a handicap. We're, I was very fortunate at Isus that nobody was nervous when I decided that we were gonna have a mascot and it was gonna be a robot with wheels. Um, if this makes you nervous, if, if being a little goofy or distinctive makes you nervous, just let go of the fear because fear influences way too much product marketing out there. So many B2B pieces of collateral, so many B2B brands, so many B2B websites have fear written all over them. They are so bland. They are so afraid of looking different, of offending anybody, or of seeming too small, or too funky, or too different, that they just end up looking alike. So throw away that fear. A brand needs to be creative to survive, and yes, even in B2B. Your brand does not need to be a beige carpet. Really, even if you are selling, we're selling enterprise software. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you, you can't get a less consumer oriented, <coughs> less sexy thing than enterprise software. Um, and even there you can afford to, in effect, you need to be creative and the smaller you are, and we are a 37 person company, and we're competing against the likes of Microsoft. So the smaller you are, the more you need to be creative to stand out. You don't, I think when people are at small companies, they try to appear big by appearing corporate, which translates into bland. Let's look like we're a bigger company than we really are by putting the proverbial skyscraper on our homepage. By having very, very bland corporate fonts, very bland corporate messaging on our website, it'll make us look big. No, it just makes you look dull. So don't be afraid to be creative. Also, please, please focus. Um, don't aim for more than five basic value propositions about any product. If you can't say in five bullet points what your product is worth, um, go back to the drawing board and prune some of the things out. Um, sometimes, you know, you might throw everything but the kitchen sink into what your product is worth, you probably can boil it down even to three. There's a huge temptation to say everything about your product, and it goes back to needing to tell people how hard you worked on that product, especially if you are the product manager. Um, 
just resist that temptation. Just like nobody wants to hear about your entire day and how you broke a heel at 10 and then you were late for lunch. Nobody needs to hear every single detail about your product either. People are busy, they need the bottom line and that's the, the top three. Because lack of focus ends up looking either too early. In other words, we are so new to the market that we haven't even boiled down our value proposition. Or, ironically, it ends up starting to make you look kind of late. Like our product's been around for so long that by accretion, it's built up this unbelievably long list of value propositions and features because every year we just added and we didn't take anything away. So you don't look like you're at the right point in your, your product's trajectory if you have it overloaded, any product description with an unfocused list of features or benefits. It just really looks like you either didn't have time to prune because you just got there, or you didn't have time to prune because it's been hanging around for a very long time. And then <sighs> integrity. Um, very few professional market. Who here gets up in the morning and says, I'm gonna lie about my product? See, you wouldn't do that. You look like the nicest people. Um, you would definitely not do that. But people, like I said before, you can, you can get a little over-enthused about promoting a product, and when it's a technology product, especially B2B, enthusiasm really has no place. Seriously, throw your enthusiasm out. Be very enthusiastic when you go into work, and if not, you, you need another job, but don't write caffeinated content. Do not sit down after lunch and three cups of coffee and write product literature of any kind or any product descriptions, or work on your product brand when you're really pumped up because you are going to exaggerate. You just are because you like the product so much. And that never works. You have to be kind of measured and, and be measured and factual in how you describe the product. It, it is what ends up working. Um, also, this is one thing that I always like to mention. Um, the, some of the best marketing advice you're ever gonna get is gonna come from a 19th century physician and playwright who lived before the internet. Um, Anton Chekhov, always said about plotting a play that if there is a gun on the mantelpiece in the first act, it had better be fired by the third act or the audience is gonna be very disappointed. And I, I like to use that as an example in marketing because if you're going to promise people an in-depth white paper or webinar that's going to teach them something about your industry and they download the white paper and print it out and waste ink or they waste their lunch hour going to your webinar and it's just a product pitch, <laughs> with like two slides about the industry, you have failed to fire the gun that's on the mantelpiece. You have basically not delivered on the, the story arc of your marketing. And, and marketing is, at the end of the day, a story. And if you promise that the plot's gonna turn out one way and it turns out another way, your company is gonna look like it lacks integrity even when you're the most honest people on earth and your product is fabulous because the marketing comes across as faintly dishonest. So be very, very conscious of that. Good value in marketing, and, and this goes back to marketing not being fluff. Marketing in, is a driver of value in and of itself in a B2B, especially B2B tech environment. White papers, webinars, any content you put out about your product should be educational. It should have value in and of itself. And if it doesn't do that, you need to go back to the drawing board because it reflects poorly on your brand. Good content, good quality, reflects very well on your brand. So I want to move things along. So a little bit about quality. Obviously, everything you do, and again, this goes back to sometimes brand is about the pretty. Um, good, non-cliche, well-designed imagery. You don't want the picture of the people shaking hands, the picture of the people sitting at their desks. You don't want those pictures. Um, even if you have to spend extra money, go for quality, don't go for clip art, proofread everything. Three, four, 17 times, and adhere to marketing best practices. Don't scrape lists, don't spam people. You know, just do a good job. And you guys will, I know, you look like such nice people. Uh, again, content, don't be afraid to totally geek out. It's actually what your customers want. Um, if, you, if you hire a copywriter who just does ad copywriting, they may try to take out some of the technical content either because they think it's boring or they just don't understand it, put it back in. 
You almost cannot be too geeky in technical content about a product when you get down to data sheets and white papers. Obviously, on your website, you might want to keep it a little higher level. But again, one of the I, when we redid our website at eZeus, everybody loved it. But the one thing that we heard was there's not enough specific detail about the products. It just talks about the use of the product. But I actually want to know my new details about how the product works, down to how much you know space it's going to take up on my server. People want that on your website. They really did. So we put it in there. Um, do not shy away from more details. Superficial white papers with cliched advice, like a little five-pager saying that nowadays it's all about big data. Nowadays, people want products that do more than one thing. Nowadays, it's about value. Have to go away now, we hope. We really, really hope. Put something of substance in there and do not be afraid to use details. Really, this is your chance. And again, respect. Live your values. Don't talk down to customers. Don't sell pink phones. Um, and respect people's time as well. Give people valuable content. That's, that's advice that also respects people's time. Don't waste people's time with marketing fluff. Um, and respect their needs with those two-way conversations I talked about earlier. Make sure you, they know that you're listening. Which, by the way, is a terrible cliche you should never ever use in a white paper. We, we're listening. But you should actually be listening because the voice of the customer is increasingly a part of your brand, whether it's consumer-generated content or their specific feedback on features that they need. That is going to be a part of your brand and more so in the era of social media. Um, the voice of the customer is part of what defines your brand. Conversations happening on social media shape people's perception of your brand every bit as much as what you are saying in many cases even more so. So you better be listening to your customers because they are talking about your product and other potential customers are listening. So whether you like it or not, whether you join the conversation or not, and you can't control it, what the customers are saying about you is starting to define your brand. So you do need to listen. And then depth. Doing fewer things well builds brand value. Um, if you can't do you know, half a dozen white papers and dozens of videos do a few things very, very well. Um, be in tune with your industry, maintain your knowledge of what other pro products are out there, what other people are saying, what's being said at the conferences. Keep, keep your finger on the pulse of your industry and make sure everything about your, not just your product features, I mean, presumably you are keeping very close eye on your competitors and making sure your product keeps up with what competitive products out there are doing, but also make sure that everything you say in your product marketing acknowledges trends in your industry. It's very important. So here is a case study based on what um, we recently did at Isus that kind of shows how we evolved our brand into a, a product brand that stands out from our competitors. First, a little bit about us. We provide an open software platform that provides virtualized communications. We're in the cloud and virtualization space, um, and we're open source and open standards. And what our software provides is your voice, your video, your conferencing, chat, instant messaging, and social collaboration, all in a unified platform. So you can check your voicemail messages, you can conference people that you've just been emailing with, you can share files, you can instant message. It's a collaboration platform. Um, we're two and a half years old, venture-backed startup, and we're competing in a space with large legacy players. And our target audience is forward-thinking CIOs. So the target audience that this brand is aimed at is very much similar to what you guys are aiming at. It's, 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 a, tech, um, it's a tech play. So on the left is one of our competitors, Avaya, one of our, our most traditional competitors. And you can see here, that's their website. This is our website. As you can see, we did not shy away from being different or indeed require, having some images that require some interpretation. So basically what we're talking about here in this image, we are transforming people with hardwired phones to people who can communicate on any device that they want using their office phone. Um, and Avaya, as you can see here, has got the lady at a desk, 
the guy in the cardigan, all the corporate cliches. It's like they're a museum of corporate cliches. Not that I want to knock them. There's dozens of websites that are museums of corporate cliches. So this is basically how a small brand can stand out against larger competitors. Do you want to be yet another museum of corporate cliches? Or do you want to have a website that did not shy away from being very, very different? And this can make people nervous. Not, not our customers, but product managers can get nervous if they start to develop a brand that goes in this direction versus this. That's safe. Nobody ever got fired for putting together a museum of corporate cliches. There are cultures where this, this would make people think you're very weird. Um, luckily, in the startup space, you have a lot of freedom to get a little bit more creative. And what that does when you are a smaller brand is that it helps begin visually to signal why you and not a larger competitor. You know, because if we stuck with that kind of branding for us, we would just look like a small version of that. And why would you entrust your entire company's phone system to a smaller version of that? Well, you know why? It's because we're different in significant ways. And having visuals that indicate that you're different in significant ways begins to convey that message to people. But again, it's not just about the visuals. It's also about how do you put a message together. But again, the question is, what would you rather have on your website? Stuff on the left, stuff on the right. Um, you can have cliched imagery, or you can there's our mascot, by the way. And there's cartoon versions of all of, of, not all of the team, but as many as I could fit on that slide. And again, it's about straying from the, straying from the, it, we'll have questions at the end. Straying from the corporate visual brand, again, begins to signal that you are different. And then you get down to the meat and potatoes of why you're different, because a brand isn't just a visual. Um, what makes us really different is that we don't force people to buy into a predetermined IT stack in order to get their phone system out of hardware, because that's what people are doing nowadays. They're taking their phone system, which used to be a PBX, which is a physical box in your basement, and they're virtualizing it. And if you go with a large corporate competitor of ours, you end up having to buy their server software, their desk phones, their everything. With us, you just buy our software. You can run it on whatever kind of server you want. You can have, within reason, any kind of phones you want. I mean, obviously not a rotary phone. Um, but you can basically pick and choose what you want, and you don't have to buy everything lock, stock, and barrel from us, including your servers. That is a real, genuine differentiator. And what you need to do when you think about your own product is what is that real, genuine differentiator that you can signal to people? Um, and then how am I going to signal that to people? So what we did is we developed a series of thought leadership pieces that gave genuine value, not sales pitches, but real content. And then often, in a couple of cases, we were talking about things that were not yet even part of our product. They were just on our product roadmap. Um, for instance, WebRTC is part of HTML5. And essentially what it is going to do um, as it gets rolled out, and it's already part of um, Firefox, is it's going to enable you to use your browser as a phone. Just let that sink in. Your browser can be a phone. So very few people in the traditional telephony industry want to talk about that, because then why are you going to buy anything from them? What we are doing is we're finding ways to incorporate that technology in a way that's secure an enterprise, so enterprises will want to still buy software solutions that help them manage their phone systems and their communications and collaboration securely. And so we're taking a sincerely disruptive stand on an in industry issue. And this is what startups can do. And it's often the best way you can stake out a market position is you have a disruptive technology. And don't just jump up and down and say, yeah, I have a disruptive technology, so does everybody. Every single night, you can go out on the town, and you can go to a startup pitch, and 500 people will get up for 10 seconds and tell you that they have a disruptive technology. You have to say something better than that. You have to say, why are you a disruptive technology if you're at a startup? Or if you are at a larger company, but you're introducing a product that's a disruptive technology, say why and be very, very specific. If you have case studies, use case studies because they're also really good other-centered content. And also, 
take positions through white papers, through webinars, through just stuff you communicate on your website, saying very specifically, our technology is disruptive because it is technology X and it does Y as opposed to Z, which is what people are doing now. Don't just say we're here to disrupt the market and to innovate. Everybody is. Paper towels are here to disrupt the market and to innovate um, because they're quilted slightly differently. Say exactly why you're disrupting the market, with what, whose market, and how. And when you do that, our white paper, which is, by the way, like a three to five page white paper, depending on which one we're putting out there, is the single biggest driver to traffic on our site other than branded keywords. Seriously. So this is what you can accomplish if you are specific in why and how you are innovative and a disruptive technology, and why your product is innovative. This also goes to the idea that you should focus. Go deep either on a few verticals or a few messages rather than have a scattershot effect, especially if you're at a small company or you're a relatively small brand within a company, you have a limited um, budget. Focus. That HTML5 message, for instance, is a major focus for what I'm doing right now. Hone a message, think about how it can be best presented through a few target media, and then make sure the message is substantive. Again, and I, I keep repeating this, everyone is putting out sales pitches, but very, very detailed information on this is why this product is disruptive, this is why you want it, or this is what your problem is, and this is how we solve it, that's actually relatively rare and it will make you stand out, and you do not have to have the biggest budget in the world. You don't have to be the biggest company in the world. If you are very specific, very honest, very straightforward, and not afraid to be different, you are actually going to stand out a mile. So, to summarize, and then we'll have a few questions, here are the lessons learned from evolving this brand in this direction, because we had started out being more focused on telephony, less focused on virtualization. And this has been a process that has taken place over the last year to build this. And, and that, you know, one of the lessons is it can take some time, but you don't necessarily want to waste time either. Have confidence going outside the usual B2B comfort zone. Do not become a museum of corporate cliches. Detail the value of your product. Don't sell the sizzle. Don't be afraid to geek out. Be real. Even in B2B, authenticity really, really does trump the corporate look and feel. People know you are not a gigantic company, so being authentic is really, really going to be valued versus having that skyscraper look. And embrace what's distinctive about your market position and product and worldview. Just actually embrace what's different, even, even if it's a minor differentiator or in our case a major one. And more to the point, have fun. You can put a robot on your website. You really can. You don't need to have the guy in the cardigan. Um, and with that, I'd like to, I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so <laughs> I'd like to take a few questions. All the way back to slide 14? Seriously? <laughs> But this is slide 14. Uh, see, uh, you obviously were asleep, sir. <laughs> okay. We also offer free eye exams at this event. <laughs> So did you have a question or did you just want to copy the slide? <laughs> you know they're going to post them to SlideShare. <laughs> All right, just for that, I'm going to move the slide. <laughs> no, okay, I'll be fair. All right, does anybody have a question other than... Yes, sir. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you already covered this, but uh, you said your target audience is uh, CIOs. Mm -hmm. um, what size of companies are you going after? Because there's probably at least a conception that at a certain point, by having that robot or that assembly line you showed, might scare uh, the CIOs who tend to be very risk hours by nature. Red Hat and VMware are two of our biggest customers. And we have another customer that we can't talk about who's got 40,000 seats and is one of the 
major e-retailers out there. So no, nobody's gotten scared so far. Um, that, and that's kind of the point, is that it doesn't scare people. The, it's, it's not scary. Um, people have this reflective belief, um, especially in, in B2B marketing, that that's going to be scary. Um, actually, I personally find the guy in the, the gray cardigan scary. So uh, we basically aim, however, for between um, 500 seats and up. Yes. So I think back to your comparison in terms of uh, website design, the mm -hmm. left side, which was just a set of stock images, if you will, and on yours, which was a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I'm not a marketing guy, but what I generally see is people talking about images that draw people in. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've chosen to do a completely different, you know, approach. How much of that goes into people designing a website and sticking to the old and boring style to say, the point here is I want to do something big so it draws somebody in to do something rather than have them be different and look through what the different content is on the page. Um, so I, I think the question is when you're designing the visuals uh, around your branding, how much emphasis should be on uniqueness versus whether it's unique or not on drawing people in? Right. I think you can easily do both. Um, I think uniqueness in and of itself can draw people in. And you have to, we went through a lot of iterations on those images to make sure that they conveyed something meaningful about the product. Um, you, you may have to go through a lot of iterations and you shouldn't shy away from that so that the product images say something meaningful about the product and yet, you know, you steer away from cliches. You need a good designer. We were blessed by being able to hire some really, really good designers. Um, you, you and then you. You first, sir. Uh, how do you address, I mean, for your company, you have like one major product. How, how do you address a company that has multiple products that shouldn't probably be with each other? They might probably have entirely different brands. If they have to have entirely different brands, I think you need to take a two tiered approach. One is you, you have to get together and decide what your company's overall brand is and make sure it's broad enough to then support multiple other product brands so that it doesn't exclude. It doesn't necessarily have to include because that's when you get the kitchen sink effect. But for instance, if you have product brands in say telephony, healthcare, and paper products, obviously you don't want a big old caduceus and a guy in a white coat on your homepage and nothing else because then you're excluding two of your product brands. Even if that's your biggest, your healthcare is your biggest brand. Make sure you come up with something inclusive. It may have to be more vague than you feel comfortable with. And then bake out specific brands for each product. I was curious if you worked with an agency when doing your initial brand, and if so, what was your experience there? We did work with an agency. It was very good. Um, you have to find an, an agency that you feel gets you. Um, even, you know, even if you're price sensitive, you, you have to be not afraid to interview multiple agencies and feel that even before they've done their research, they kind of are on the same page as you are. And, and then it can work well. Just bear in mind that every single website or rebranding takes three times as long as you thought it would. It's not going to be done in six weeks or even the most optimistic estimate you get, or pessimistic, triple it. Just triple it. So how do you prove to others in the organization that a different approach will not scare away it, it can be tough. It takes, it takes being collaborative. It takes, like the previous speaker said, with product roadmaps. You have to bring people into the process early and let them have their say. Um, and then at some point, you have to throw a hissy fit and say, I'm the head of marketing. No, <laughs> don't, that, don't do that. <laughs> that doesn't work. Keep bringing people along. And you may find that people are at the end of the day a little less invested in what the brand says than you thought they were. And, and then once they've had their say, they just may not even have the bandwidth to, to necessarily be there for every iteration. But you want to make sure everybody feels they're heard. I think there were a couple more questions. Yes. Um, are you focused on the web itself or your brand, or do you use like Facebook or Twitter or just the web? Um, we're, we use a fair amount of Twitter, and I've actually generated leads off of Twitter. Um, you have to, again, with Twitter at the same, same token, make sure you're very on brand. Don't curate content that's outside of the message that you're saying. Um, for instance, if there's an industry report that says, 
Um, people don't want to streamline their IT operations. Um, if you tweet that, obviously make some kind of editorial comment that you don't agree. Um, make sure everything you do, that's a very good point, um, make sure everything you do on social media kind of is part of your brand message. Don't just have somebody randomly tweeting. That's why I'm not a big fan, going back to the agency thing, of having an agency do your social media. They don't get you as well as you get yourself. I mean, would you have your cousin run your Facebook page for you? No! You'd probably become unemployable and possibly get arrested, even if they're a law-abiding citizen, just because they'd be saying the wrong things. Um, don't. Don't do that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Stop. Okay. All right, I think we're all going to go eat lunch now. Thank you, everybody.